session and our final one for today will focus on a specific issue in this regard, unsupervised real-time anomaly detection. Here to explain, we have two data scientists from Telefonica, Aitor Landete and Pablo Mateos. Welcome, Aitor and Pablo. Are you there? You are. That's great. Yeah. How are you? You're with me. How are you? Very well. How are oh. you? Yeah. Okay. So thanks, Nicola, for the introduction. You're welcome. Uh, I'm going to, to start my presentation to, to share my my screen. Let's and we'll... So go ahead. Yes. Okay. Let's do it. Are you seeing my yes, presentation? Yes, Pablo, we can okay. see it. Go ahead. Everything's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. So first of all, uh, as is our first sign here, so thank you for considering our talk for this event. Uh, we have like uh, to present this talk with audience, but due to the current situation, it's a pity. Uh, we are going to try to do our best online. At least we hope to explain everything as well as we would do in uh, uh, on stage, so let's do it. So, uh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our talk. Uh, first of all, we are going to present ourselves. We are Aitor Landete and Pablo Mateos, and we work at Data Scientists, as uh, Nicolas said, uh, at Telefonica, uh, specifically in IoT and Big Data Telefonica Tech. Uh, our role is the developing tailor made solutions according to business client needs. Uh, we acting uh, as a consultant, consultant uh, agency. So one of the um, pro projects that we were, we were involved is one related with real time anomaly detection. And today we are going to, uh, to present the topic uh, about real time anomaly detection and root code estimation. Uh, to put uh, well, focus on, on this kind of, of, of topic, currently a growing number of business problems uh, are based on real-time uh, metric analysis, from credit flows to predictive maintenance. So right now we are moving to an era where all sensor devices are, as you know, uh, are connected through internet. For this reason, it is crucial to, to refine data analytics uh, in real time to reach uh, all the sector with more advanced and cutting edge technology, such imagine, uh, for example, a more a smart cities, industry 4.0, uh, or a smart healthcare. So we are going, we are going to, to see in our presentation. In this, uh, in this talk, we are focused on super unsupervised real-time anomaly detection. We are going to present an unsupervised real-time anomaly detector based on a LSTN neural, neural network uh, forecaster. In addition to this, we are going to present an automatized way to detect the root cut of such anomalies uh, in cases we will have the RFD post-up from different metrics. For the end, uh, we focus on these uh, this anomaly points that uh, occur simultaneous on a subset of uh, this, uh, all these uh, monetized metrics. In order to, to estimate this, uh, this root cause, uh, we analyze correlation between the metrics we are going to study that belong to that subset. Uh, and we are going to, uh, to do this with different uh, approaches. Uh, for example, cosine similarity, correlation of tokenized metric name, etc. Example of these situations or in which uh, this uh, approach uh, can fix well, for example, uh, new releases of an app whose metrics are monitoring are changing when you release a, a new feature, uh, transportation services, etc. All together uh, give us a common future for all these uh, anomaly points, which may towards to the origin of anomaly behavior detected. So during this talk, uh, we are going to review the context of anomaly detection, in particular uh, case uh, in real time. We are going through uh, our solution, what really, uh, results we have obtained, and uh, what kind of root cause we can assign it 
and the next step to improve our system. So let's start. First of all, we are going to explain in an informative way what, what is an anomaly. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, anomaly is uh, is a broad uh, in a broad sense uh, is difficult to define because it's not exactly uh, this term how to to define because it changes from uh, one domain to another. But in general way, we can say that anything that is uh, anomalous is any any instance or sample that not follow the collective uh, common pattern and therefore is easy to separate from the rest of the data. Besides all this, uh, we can also dif differentiate between anomalies and outliers because uh, the former of the all the things considered abnormal included noise. However, anomalies are a special case that has a significant information of interest. And this is important for us because we can uh, explain the, the anomaly with a root cause uh, analysis. So how we we deal with this uh, kind type of data? Well, first, there is a concept that is anomaly detection. So basically, anomaly detection is the process of finding patterns in the data that don't do not confirm the expected behavior uh, in our in our in the rest of the data. In other words, it's about capturing and isolated anomalies from the rest of the normal data. So what kind of applications uh, can fit uh, anomaly detection techniques? And what type of applications are they useful? Well, detection anomaly is widely used in many sectors, such as uh, uh, in banking, in credit fraud, in cybersecurity for interaction detection, or in healthcare, detecting medical anomalies, for example, such the heartbeat, the patient's uh, heartbeat. As you can see here in uh, in the in the image. So uh, before to deep, di uh, deep dive in, in anomaly detection, we have to differentiate or to explain the uh, pre the main aspect of anomaly detection problems. For anomaly detection problems, there, there are several uh, aspects must be taken into account. Uh, before embarking on the fully uh, on the tax. These aspects are definition of normality to know what is normal and what is not. This will depend on the constant of the domain of, the, of study, characteristics of the data, depending on, of its nature, uh, uh, an approximation or another will be used, uh, type of anomalies, not all anomalies are the same, of, if of then depending on, depending on how we define uh, them, then, to have the, their own features. What result do we obtain by detecting anomalies, or rather, what we do to define that a sample is abnormal or not? And finally, when we have detected the anomaly, uh, we we need to, to verify if our system is doing, doing it correctly. For this, we need to have a series of metrics, a series of performance evaluation metrics to, to, eval to evaluate, to test, to assess the behavior of our system. Okay, so defining the normality, uh, normality is a complex concept because it depends on the business context that is being working on. As I mentioned before, uh, anomaly detection technique uh, provide patterns to determine uh, those samples that are not normal. Therefore, it's important to know what is uh, normal and what is not. It's necessary to have a balance, a balanced trade-off uh, between the, all the nuances of normal behavior on, and not to be too generic when it comes uh, this uh, every nuance of normal data and treat like uh, as anomaly. So let's illustrate this with an example. So um, the main issue with anomaly detection that is that is an ill-defined problem. It's necessary to carefully observe uh, the complex uh, picture, the whole picture of the data to determine uh, with high confidence what is an uh, anomaly or, or not. In this example here uh, on, on the right, the image on the right, uh, we can see clearly that if we isolate different parts of the signal, the consideration of what is uh, an anomaly, uh, anomaly changes. For example, in the first red uh, square on the on the left, the big one, 
uh, the peaks could be anomaly, but if we compare with the rest of the data, with the red square in the uh, in the middle, we can see that uh, this anomaly, the uh, consideration anomaly change. Also, it's occurred with the with the last one. So, okay. Continuing with the important aspect of anomaly, we we have defined uh, what is uh, the normal uh, the normality that the normality define the normality is important. We uh, had to have in consideration to take into account uh, the characteristics of the data. Data is normally described by a series of attributes, like in tabular uh, data. In anomaly detection, we can treat uh, can be treated problems uh, as a univariate univariate uh, approach data with a single attribute or multivariate approach. Furthermore, this attribute can be quantitative or numerical or qualitative or categorical. Type of anomalies. Uh, we also had to consider what kind of anomaly. Knowing the type of the data that we can face, we must look at a complete a picture of this and we go to the types of anomaly. Not of anomalies behave in the same way of are considered in uh, similar. By definition, there are three types of anomaly. Point anomaly, uh, when an instance compared by itself with the rest of the instances uh, leave the group, is considered a point anomaly. We can see clearly here the, the clusters, uh, the, the layers of anomalies don't belong uh, to any of the, of the clusters. Collective anomalies is a collection of related anomalies are anomaly compared to the rest of, of the data. Here we can see the example of electrocardiogram and see how the heart uh, rate stops for a period uh, collectively. So we are facing a failure at a normality. Uh, and the last one, contextual, is an instant in a particular context behaves abnormally. For example, the temperature according to a period of the year, a season of the year, and in winter is great to find a very high temperatures. So uh, ultimately, uh, the um, the goal of anomaly detection is to identify whether uh, the anomalies are in the data. For this, uh, we can use two different versions, two different approaches. Through a score, calculating a metric for a system for each sample, it can be a probability, a distance, a count. Then by defini uh, defining a threshold, we can see which are considered anomalies or which are not. On the other hand, we have the labels. We have data that have associated label indicating whether uh, they are anomalies or not. We must simply implement algorithms that are capable or discriminate to discriminate between the labels that are anomalies or those that are not. So uh, continue with this, uh, depending on whether the data is uh, labeled or not, we must choose among a great variety of machine learning techniques. If we have um, historical data, uh, we can use supervised approaches. If not, we, need, uh, we will need a supervised methods to discover anomalous pattern. This is the key to real-time data sources like IoT sensors. So, uh, among all, all the a great variety of techniques uh, used for anomaly detection, we can find uh, here this dia diagram. So some of them, which area of the family, for example, the most basic ones, uh, such as stream value analysis to the most common one, neural networks. Uh, the, la the latter will be uh, the ones we will use in our solution. And um, finally, uh, the final aspect to, to consider in anomaly detection is uh, to take into account is the performance evaluation. For unsupervised cases, it's difficult since we don't have uh, any label, but we must do an exploration a study of the pattern associated with abnormal samples. For an uh, supervised case, we will use well, well known, uh, known metrics in classification tasks, such as confusion matrix that measure the rate of positive and negative classified well and badly, other metrics like such as accuracy, specificity, uh, precision, or recall. And finally, we can use also rock uh, out cube to, trade, to test the trade-off between the rate of true positive versus the rate of false positive uh, for different thresholds. So we, we can check uh, 
we have checked uh, all the aspects uh, for anomaly detection, and now we are moving on to real-time uh, case. Uh, why is important uh, real-time anomaly detection? Uh, be before navigating the, the world of real-time anomaly detection, let's take a look at the difference uh, between batch and versus real-time processing, because it's important to have this idea. Well, uh, we use, you can see here in the diagram, uh, we have uh, two different uh, versions for processing, the batch and the real-time processing version. We use batch uh, when the reaction time is not critical, is the time is not a critical factor to, to explore the anomalies. We can collect a large collection of data and apply any algorithm to detect anomalies in that period. There's any, there's no rush to capture anomalies. We can iterate uh, over and over with, with our algorithm to improve its accuracy. With this methodology, we will obtain fewer fault uh, positives because uh, we can iterate uh, our algorithm to, to, improve it, to improve it. But it is, has also some, some drawback that is uh, less scalable when you have a lot of data and computationally more, more expensive. On the other hand, we have the real time. Uh, here, we don't need to see the entire data stream. The system uh, continues learning. We don't need a manual supervision. The problem is that currently almo almost all uh, mature learning algorithms are designed to be used in a batch way. So this represents a great challenge when generating a new solution to the uh, real time case. Because the system evolves and the data behavior changes over the time, uh, user, for example, uh, behave different uh, navigating from uh, in a online website so this is the the purpose of real time online or online machine learning algorithm it must be taken into account that we must build a system capable of detecting new anomalies without having program threshold so they are capable of adapting over time because the system evolves and the data behavior changes over time and finally, for real-time systems, it's necessary, necessary to take into account that one of the obstacles that we, ma we must overcome is early detection. We need to anticipate when, detect uh, when detecting an event. This process is quite challenging, and right now it's one of the main standing blocks in real-time system. Okay, what is important? Uh, it's important because the massive increase in streaming time series data to, is leading to a shift to a real-time anomaly detection. In order to estimate the new normal, <laughs> imagine right now in the current situation, is you it could be used in different and uh, multiple uh, sectors from sales, marketing to supply chain, Manufacturing, every of the stage of this business requires sufficient information to adapt their strategy and maximize their productivity. Um, finally, uh, in IoT is, is a growing technology and the projections that are made in the future, as you can see in terms on revenue are increasing. We can see uh, that it's a very conducive uh, field to apply this type of system. Okay, so let's move on uh, first to, to time series data. We see the aspect in a general way, but we are going to focus on time series data. And in this case, in real time detection, the time component is essential variable. So in this case, the ties, this type of data must be treated differently from the sample, from samples uh, in the past, uh, for some uh, known tabular data. A time series is nothing more than a series of observations taking over a ten time range, usually with similar intervals. This uh, we had to treat differently because the time series uh, normally, typically, they have a, a a series of components that are trend, seasonality, or cyclic variation, and also a noise and irregular variation. This component. Uh, you can see that can be illustrated in, the, in a simple way in the in the following images. So also uh, in turn uh, in turn the time series depending on the type of the trend 
and seasonality they have, they can consider also multiplicative and additive. Uh, this is because each uh, component affects the final time series in a multiplicative or additive way. So we have to consider also to take into account these, these considerations. Um, in order to, to provide a good real-time anomaly detector, we have to consider uh, these uh, five points. Uh, the timelessness, uh, the scale, the rate of change, and consistency, and definition of incidence. Uh, we have some several questions with uh, with each uh, belonging to each, uh, each point, each bullet. Uh, the timeliness is referred to how often does a business or company need to know uh, that something is abnormal, is periodicity, scale is how large the data is going to be handled, uh, rate of change, the data evolves over the time, or otherwise is static, there are few variations. Consciousness is about explaining an abnormal anomaly and do we have to take into that cloud a lot of metrics, multiple metrics, several metrics to explain the context in which the event happened. And finally, the definition of incidents. If we already knew the anomaly, we have prior information, we are able to define them and later categorize them. So if we move to, to time and scale, as I said before, yeah, when something abnormal occurs, uh, any any business needs to know uh, rapidly to to act correctly. So currently, most of the company needs real time methodologies, online or real time algorithms process the data sequentially. They need the, this input to analyze to use it to improve uh, to improve the predictor in the next step. Is uh, they have the, the advantage that they make them escape better. However, they tend to be more prone to fall positive. So we have to consider the timeless and the and the scale in this situ in, in this case for real time uh, anomaly detection. The rate of change is referred to to that the environment change. The when a app or online website, an online business, they launch it uh, they launch out a new feature the be yeah, user behavior change because the patterns of the users also also change so we have to take into account the type of business we deal with for example uh, in automatic industrial processes really we have a very sharp change the rate of a change is important since it affects which model is going to be chosen for detection anomalies Algorithm uh, can be handled uh, depending on the change in the in the data are, are needed. Uh, in the example, um, on the right we we see two time series uh, where we see a very stable series over the time. However, in the image below we see a, on the red arrow how during a specific day there is a sudden change. So we have to be alert to be aware about this type of a situation. The consistency uh, is mean the system take uh, a lot of uh, multiple uh, metrics, taking into account different metrics to have a holistic version. Only by combining metrics, we are able to know what is happening or what not. Analyzing them individually may not clarify the root cause of the problem. Therefore, we there are two ways to treat this aspect, univariate and multivariate. If we go, as we have said before, there are uh, two, two ways to face this problem. Here we present a third solution that proposed that means uh, is proposed that means both the hybrid hybrid approach is learned from normal model for each metric, combine the anomalies to a single incident. If the metrics are related, is scalable, main interpretation of from group of anomal anomalies, combine multiple types of metric behavior, and start methods for discovering the relationship. In the case of a uh, definition incident, it's occurred the same. Uh, we have proposed a, another another hybrid approach in which uh, mix is a mixture between a, a supervised method and a supervised method using a few label example to improve the detection and supervised method converting uh, into a semi-supervised using unsupervised detection for and no cases and supervise detection to classify already in no cases. 
So what is the typical um, process in the learning normal pattern behavior? Anomaly detection uh, helps companies to determine when something changes in the normal business pattern, as we have said uh, before. But uh, the three main steps are uh, we calculate a statistical test if the sample are explained by the model, the normal behavior uh, is modeled by, by this algorithm, and then uh, we indicate is uh, the sample are anomaly or not. So I'm going um, uh, from from here. Uh, it will, will continue my my workmate uh, I told explaining some techniques and uh, our model and the result of things and also the root cut analysis. So this is your turn, uh, I told. Okay, thank you, Pablo. I hope that now everyone we are on the same page. Okay, and now we are all excited on uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, fast growing um, area that where we can obtain many interesting results. Okay, so now let's going to jump to the meat of the talk. Okay, now uh, Pablo uh, told us. Uh, excellent introduction where he was discussing about, <clears throat> sorry about my voice, uh, he was discussing about uh, the importance of real-time anomaly detection and how we are going to detect these anomalies. But now let's going to, to uh, think about something, okay? When, when someone is talking about detecting anomalies uh, in, uh, by uh, professional deformation, we usually go to clustering algorithms, okay? So now let's going to recap a bit the, the, the different anomaly detector algorithms, and now we are going to go to the, to the meat of the talk, okay? So first of all, we can detect anomalies by clustering algorithms, but this is kind of uh, not suitable. Why? Because clustering algorithms are not sensitive to, to time, okay? So they cannot infer from the context, okay, of uh, what an anomaly an anomalous point it means, okay? So one way out to this uh, problem would be to generate uh, time classes, okay? Like, no, uh, sorry, Pablo, go to, to the, uh, okay. It would be to generate time classes, okay? And these time classes we can give uh, to the data, to the different data points, we can give a sense of time, okay? So we can generate a time class that would be, I don't know, morning, uh, night, weekend, whatever, okay? Whatever we are interested in, in, in to analyze. And then we can just perform a, a clustering algorithm where we obtain the anomalies in these different time classes, okay? And examples of this would be to use isolation forest, one class super, uh, super, uh, super machines, et cetera, et cetera. Let's go, Pablo. Okay. A more refined way to, to detect anomalies in, in time series would be to use autoencoders, okay? Autoencoders are intended to compress the time series metrics into a lower dimensional latent space and recrustate them, okay? So examples of that are LSTM-based uh, autoencoders and also variational autoencoders. Other examples in the literature that we would be like multi-channel convolutional neural network encoder and an LSTM decoder, okay? But anomalies in this case are spotted in different ways. It could be done by reconstruction error of pro or probability reconstruction, okay? Or by clustering in the latent space, okay? These are the two different ways where we can spot anomalies in this kind, with this kind of detectors. So, Pablo? Okay, and this is the, 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 the king of the, the anomaly detectors, okay? That are time series forecasts, okay? These are the most widespread methods uh, to for, and, and, and the concept of this type of uh, algorithms is quite simple. It's just to forecast the future and to compare the, or predictions with real uh, time uh, points that we are receiving, okay? So this would be our preferred uh, way to spot anomalies in real time, okay? So examples of these are LSTM group-based forecasters, uh, one-dimensional convolutional neural network forecasters. Also, we can use uh, classic uh, algorithms like Sari, Maul, Hall, Winters, and uh, regressors uh, of any kind, uh, like for instance, HG Boost of LightGVM, okay? So let's jump, okay. So how we do we spot anomalies uh, with this type of uh, uh, algorithms? Okay, the first naive way that uh, someone can think about is to set a hard threshold, okay? That it will be a low, an upper and lower admissible value, okay? And everything that goes uh, above these thresholds will be an anomaly. Or even it would be to, in a more refined way, it would be just to take 
the mean and standard deviation and everything that goes up and down of these uh, kind of thresholds would be the uh, would be the, the anomaly. Okay, a more refined way. Go back. With normality of the residuals, we can assume that a point is anomalous if it's a beyond three rolling standard deviations. Okay, of the rolling standard deviation, but there is a better in in our uh, in our opinion, there is a better way that is able be to use confidence intervals. Okay, where we make predictions, but these predictions have a confidence interval where uh, uh, we are sure about the prediction of the forecasted predictions. So any point that is outside these uh, bounds would be considered as anomalous. Okay, so Pablo. Okay, so our solution. Now let's going to talk about serious things. Okay, so let's go uh, to the next one. Okay, the thing is that we are uh, providing a method to spot anomalies in real time. Okay, uh, in an unsupervised way. So if it's a uh, real time unsupervised way and is uh, automatic, the thing is that we have to handle uh, different uh, patterns in time series, okay? So in a large data set, it's quite probable to find different types of behavior of this time series. So is it possible to fit them all in a unique model? And we will see uh, how we handle this, okay? So, okay, also, the thing is that as data is streaming in our, uh, uh, in our model, the thing is that we have to detrend and, and, and remove the seasonality of this uh, data, okay? And this, and we cannot do this uh, by hand, okay? Because it will be nonsense. It will remove all the purpose of this uh, tool. So to do that, uh, we have to consider the seasonal pattern in order to avoid false anom anomalies, okay? And knowing the seasonal, let's go back, Pablo. And knowing the seasonal pattern is possible uh, to detect the anomalies in, in that way. And also we can see that, uh, we also have the trend, the seasonality, but also we have com we can have combined seasonalities. Like in the uh, right hand side plot, we can see that we have a seasonality pattern, and on top of that, we have another seasonality pattern. Okay, so the thing is that we have to remove all of this in order to ingest it in the model. So let's go to the next one. Okay, so. We have seen that uh, removing trend and seasonality is crucial for time series analysis, okay, to ensure a correct performance when predicting what is normal and what is abnormal, okay. So what we do, what, uh, we, do uh, we do this process in an automatic way, okay. First of all, we have to detrain the data. How do we detrain the data, okay? So we have a we have our uh, time series metric, okay. So we remove the uh, central part of this time series metric, and what we do is to interpolate between the first part and the and the later part, okay? And then we can spot whether the data has trend or not, okay? And then uh, doing that, if we, uh, if automatically is detected that there is a trend in that data, we detrend it, okay? We just remove it. But there is a second uh, and most complicated part that is to detect seasonality and to uh, remove it, okay? So how do we do that, okay? To do that, we just uh, okay, depending on the granularity of the data, we select a predefined periodicity band, okay, and we obtain the, the ACF plot, okay. Then what we do is to iterate over all uh, over a predefined threshold, okay, okay, and we find all the spikes that are uh, above uh, a certain threshold, okay, that is the threshold that is given by the ACF, okay, essentially, okay. So what we do is to measure these spikes, the the the, the difference between these spikes, the number of lags that there are there. So doing that, we are um, able to spot the the uh, the most significant the most significant uh, periodicity bands, okay, and not accordingly, okay, and then remove it. And but the thing is that we can we do that and we are kind of sure that uh, this is done perfectly okay and we are uh, pristine. But the thing is that always there is a test okay that we have to pass okay automatically the, the we have to pass these three tests okay the augmented uh, Dickey Fuller test the KPSS test and the Ganova Hansen test for seasonality okay. So we do this process automatically and and the test has to be passed okay. Perfect. So now let's going to talk about the anomaly detector model that we are using. Okay, we have talked that we have said that what we are doing is kind of the trend and this is and remove seasonality uh, from the data. Okay, and now the data is perfectly uh, prepared to be ingested in our model. And what model do we use? We have seen that there are plethora of models. What do we use? We know, and it's well known in the in this uh, sector 
that there is no preferred way to spot anomalies, to do forecasts. There is, there is uh, si simply speaking, there is no such a preferred model. Okay, so what we use as a preferred model for us is to use an ensemble model. And this ensemble model is a LSTM encoders, image casters, uh, SGBoost, and LGBM, and Profit. Okay, we have all these models, and these all models form or a mother model. Okay, so let's go to the next one. But you have seen that there are a bunch of models, and a bunch of models imply a bunch of uh, computational cost, and this is not good. So uh, the thing is that this ensemble model is the one that is offering the best results, as we are going to see. But what happens that there is no free lunch here? There is there is a, com a com it is comp computationally costly, okay, and it may be not suitable for all all cases, okay. So matching restrictions, budget restrictions. Etc. There are many restrictions that can uh, avoid us to use this kind of model. Okay, so what we did is to develop a lighter model, an alternative. Okay, that is working kind of okay. Okay, so this model is an LSTM based forecaster, but uh, it's obtaining its uh, confidence interval with a sto a stochastic dropout. Why a stochastic dropout? Uh, would you say why are you using this? Okay, the thing is that uh, to you to obtain a confidence interval uh, in inference uh, with LSTM forecasters, we have to uh, activate dropout for inference. Okay, so the thing is that if you set a predefined uh, dropout in these layers, the thing is that we notice that what is happening is that you are kind of biasing the width of the threshold of, of width of the confidence interval because. Let's think about this. You set a threshold of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, I don't care, okay? And you just comp uh, compute the confidence interval. The thing is that if you just jump to another threshold that it would be bigger, for instance, you will notice that this uh, confidence interval is larger. So that makes you uh, to be in a kind of a uh, tricky situation is, what threshold uh, do I use? I am biasing my, my anomalies. So we notice that using a stochastic, a stochastic dropout, which is to put random uh, dropout rates uh, for the layers and, and, and bootstrap or results for a large amount of iterations, we obtain some kind of a stable um, confidence interval, okay, for predictions. So let's go to the next one. Okay, and now you may be thinking, okay, how are you training your models? Okay, so there is a, a question that is, do we train a model for each metric? This is kind of uh, not scalable, okay? This is, if I have two metrics, three metrics, this would be okay. But if I have a, a thousand metrics, I, I, I cannot do that. It's just it's just impossible to, to do that, okay? But the thing is that one would say, okay, but if I am doing this, I, am, I have a good performance. It's just my predictions are kind of optimal. But the, the other way around, the, the other side is, do I train a single model for all the metrics? This lo looks better in terms of scalability. Yes, I have a, a gigantic model that is uh, making predictions about, I don't know, uh, these 1,000 metrics, but this is not kind of okay, okay? Because the performance will drop dramatically. So fortunately, there is a midpoint that this is the thing that we are using, which improves scalability while committing with performance. Okay, so we go to the next one. What do we do? What we do is to package uh, metrics that are kind of similar in some way and put it in the in the same model. Okay, what we use is to use the the package uh, TS features. Okay, and this package um, has is uh, was done in R and it has a Python implementation. And the thing is that what we are using uh, this is something that we are studying because this is something that is a uh, common sense uh, what we did, but we want to refine this even more. Okay, what we saw is that using metrics that are homogeneous in terms of seasonality improve model accuracy if they are trained together in the same model. Okay, so this is one way in order to uh, improve scalability, okay, to have less models and to also improve the accuracy. If we go to the next one, okay. So now let's going to, to go to the results. You will be saying, okay, these guys were, uh, were telling me uh, some stuff about the time series metrics and anomaly detection, but what do they have? Okay, so let's go to the next one. First of all, uh, before digging into a complex case, okay, let's going to focus on the most simple case that we can handle, that is a univariate case, okay? We have a single metric and we want to spot the anomalies of uh, these metrics. Um, 
in an unsupervised way, okay? So in order to do that, we used uh, the data set that is called the Yahoo Synthetic and Real-Time Series data set, okay, that it was provided to us by the Yahoo Web Scope program, okay? And the results that we are going to show you is uh, correspond to the A1 benchmark, okay, data, uh, which consists on a 67 different univariate real production traffic of, of Okay, but what is going on? The thing is that these anomalies are labeled. So we train our model in an unsupervised way, we spot the anomalies, and then we are able to compare with uh, reality. Okay, so using a labeled data set allows us to, uh, to, to compare and to see if our model is kind of good. Okay, so these 60 different univariate M series have different seasonality patterns, different anomaly types, different anomaly balances. Okay, so because they are, for instance, there are uh, metrics that they have uh, like 200 anomalies over uh, 1400 uh, different timestamps, and there are other uh, metrics that they have no anomalies. Okay, what are the combined results? For the ensemble model, we obtain a recall of 0.92. Okay, so we are almost spotting all the labeled anomalies. Okay, the thing is that, and this is a course for uh, anomaly detection in if, by forecasting, is the the amount of false positives that uh, that uh, we encode, okay? So the thing is that in our case, we obtain a precision, it's dropping, okay, the 0.92 case, it's dropping to 0.82. That is kind of uh, uh, okay, okay? Because we compare results with other results in the literature that unfortunately there are not too many, but we saw that using other type of uh, algorithms that were obtaining like a 0.60 something, okay? so. This is a, ma a massive improvement on, uh, compared to these results. For the lighter case, okay, no, let's go to the, to the back. For the lighter case, okay, the light model, that it will be the LSTM-based uh, forecaster, okay, we, the results drop, okay, that is a recall of 0.85 uh, and a precision of 0.74, but uh, the thing is that this model is uh, faster and lighter, okay? So that's the trade-off that we have to face. Let's go to the next one, okay. Now we have uh, some remarkable examples, okay? And let's going to make some, um, uh, to be kind of proud of these examples, okay? This is not what is going on in all the metrics, but these are kind of the, the ones that makes you proud, okay? So this, uh, these uh, metrics, okay, that they will correspond to the test1.csv, okay, from this data set, uh, there are only two real anomalies, okay? And we spot with our model, with the LSTM-based forecaster, we spot only three anomalies, okay? So we have a recall of one, okay, that we will be impressive, a precision of 0.66, okay? That's kind of a pity, and an F-core of 0.8. What is going on? If you see this uh, plot, you see that the two true positives are kind of hidden. One, if someone is looking this kind of uh, metric, would say, okay, this high spike that is around the 1200 uh, timestamp, for sure that's an anomaly. And no, that's not an anomaly, and also our model is not detecting that as an anomaly. So that's kind of remarkable. The pity is that we uh, we detect this kind of spike that is around the uh, seven, uh, 700 timestamp, that is unfortunately a false positive, okay? But for us, it's kind of an impressive result. And next one, okay. And now let's go into to more, uh, to better results, okay? And this is the ensemble model, okay? That this is the flagship of the <laughs> of the anomaly detector, okay? The ensemble model in this case, uh, they, uh, this case has a 227 label anomalies and we found 249. And the recall is impressive in this case, it's 0.98. So we are almost detecting in an unsupervised way, almost all of the, true anomalies that they are in this data set. The precision, as we are seeing, the precision drops uh, because uh, we are obtaining some false positives. Also, we cannot think, uh, we cannot uh, blame uh, Yahoo, okay? We cannot think that there are some kind of anomalies that are not spotted that resemble like an anomaly, okay? But we cannot complain about that. So, okay, this is the univariate case. And uh, let's jump to the next one. The next one, this is kind of more complicated, okay? This is the multivariate case. So now we are using a more complex data set that consists on a, a 51 different sensors, okay? And these sensors are called sensor 
zeros and so on, etc. And in this case, uh, they are coming from an open data set that is called the PAMP sensor data set, okay? It consists of 50, uh, 51 different sensors, okay, that are monitoring the water pump on a small area far from a big town, okay? And this is kind of uh, the thing that we are hoping to to, to apply this kind of model. So there will be a streaming data source and it's controlling some uh, important uh, thing that is the water pump for a city and spotting anomalies in real time. In this case, we have different labels, okay, which correspond to system failures and recovery stages, okay, of the pump, where the pump is working abnormally. So our goal in this case will be to predict in a supervised way the anomalous behavior of this, of this water pump, and then uh, try to to see how how it's working. Okay, so okay, so this is uh, we are going, we are not going to to show you the the results for all of the 51 sensors. Okay, so these are the predictions of our model, and we see the anomalies, and we see the predictions, and we see also the the <clears throat> the real data. Okay, that is hidden behind. Uh, what is going on here? Uh, let's go back, Pablo. Okay, Le, what is going on here? Here, uh, there is kind of a uh, problem. Okay, here here we are spotting more false positives. Okay, we are spotting more false negatives than in the other case that it was kind of. Uh, uh, amazing to, to show, but uh, this is, it would be a, a kind of a real case. We're spotting anomalies that are not anomalies, okay, like for instance, uh, there is a dot, it, it will not be crystal clear for, for you, but if you have the PDF, that one. That That's a, a, a point that it's kind of an anomaly, okay, for all of the metrics, but uh, it's supposed that this is not an anomaly, we don't know, okay? So the thing is that here, what we are predicting are zeros and ones. Okay, and the thing is that these zeros and ones are labeled, and we are going to see now the results. And now, in the root case estimation, uh, what we are going to do is try to infer what is the the working stage of these uh, of these uh, sensors of this water pump. So let's go jump to the next one. Okay, here we see that there is a kind of a drop in the in the metrics in the uh, evaluation metrics uh, compared to the <clears throat> to the to the other case okay but it's still are kind of reasonable okay so we obtain 89 0.89 in recall okay so we are almost spotting the 90 percent of uh, the true positives okay in a data set that is gigantic compared to the other one that the other one had only 1400 uh, timestamps and this one had uh, i don't remember but it had a kind of a lot and we spot 90% of anomalies in an unsupervised way. The precision uh, at this uh, going on uh, usually is dropping because uh, we are course with the false positives, but it's kind of reasonable, okay? It's uh, like a 0.8. And for the lighter version, okay, the LSTM forecaster with the stochastic dropout, we didn't show the, 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 the plots, but the results are kind of reasonable as well, okay? Around 0.7 in precision and recall. And the anomalies that we are spotting, it's uh, in real time in an, in an unsupervised way without prior knowledge. And this is important. It is no prior knowledge uh, of the real anomalies. Uh, we think that this is remarkable. So let's go jump to the next one. Okay, so now we have seen about detecting anomalies, okay, in real time. But the thing is that uh, are we interested in detecting real anomalies? Are we more interested maybe, or perhaps in detecting, uh, let's say the cause of the anomaly in order to act? So the thing, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, may we give an estimation about the origin of the, anomal of the anomalous behavior detected? So let's jump to the next one. Okay, so the importance of, of spotting anomalies is, 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 is gigantic, okay, and we can, uh, all uh, rely on that, okay? But the thing is that if we really want to extract um, uh, extract actions from these anomalies, we require to give a, a, a description of or, or kind of an origin of this anomaly in order to ensure a fast action response to remedy the, the, the anomalous behavior. So examples of that of these are latency critical task, okay? That this is uh, we cannot. Uh, uh, neglect this, be like such as anomal uh, autonomous driving or augmented reality, okay, where the latency is critical and the experience uh, would be uh, uh, enormously changed if we cannot 
put remedy to these anomalies, okay? There are other anomalies that are equally important that are related with welfare and emergencies, okay? Such as the, mal the malfunctioning of some critical elements like electrical or water supplies, that example that we were discussing before. Also security, okay? Estimating the, the, the anomalous cause that is hidden in the anomalous behavior in cyber security, like for instance, we are monitoring some uh, uh, server, okay? And we detect anomalous behavior. Okay, this anomalous behavior, what is telling us? Is this something that uh, will be... Okay, this is important to, to detect. Okay, like payments or transportations are also other uh, cases where we can discuss about this. So next one. So first of all, in order to give a meaning or an explanation of the metrics, we have to understand the metrics, okay? So typically it's very hard to understand what is going on at a single metric level, okay? So we have a single metric level, we have an anomaly, okay, let's face it, and that's it. But once we are dealing with multivariate time series metrics, we cannot do that. We, can, we have to extract meaning of what is going on there, okay? So it is necessary to isolate uh, which metrics are related, okay? So otherwise the model could lead to unexplainable situations because metrics are completely unrelated, okay? So we have to correlate metrics and this is the crucial word that uh, we have to tell in this part over and over, correlations. So let's go to the next one. Okay, so the thing is that now in unsupervised root cause estimation, we have no ground truth about the origin of the anomalies, okay? You, we just know that there is an anomaly and that's it, okay? So we must rely on correlations among the metrics which are anomalous simultaneously, okay? So we have some anomalous behavior, but this anomalous behavior has to be done in all the metrics, okay? Well, in a set of metrics, okay? And the thing is that is to be uh, to be able to correlate uh, these metrics that are anomalous at the same time in order to extract knowledge from that. So how do we do that? So let's go to the next. Uh, okay, we follow three different ways to uh, give an explanation to these metrics, okay? The first thing will be to a normal base similarity, okay? We know we have a time series metric, okay? And this time series metric uh, has some values, okay? Now we have passed or uh, anomaly detector, and now this time series metric, it can be converted into a vector of zeros, that it is no, no anomaly, or ones, that is anomaly, or zeros or anomaly scores, okay, uh, whatever. The thing is that this uh, series, okay, that are now vectorized in this rep representation can be clustered in order to put together the, the, the anomalies that uh, the metrics that are similar in the uh, in their behavior in terms of anomalies. Okay, this would be the first one, the first way to correlate metrics. The other one, and this kind of uh, we were thinking a lot about this, and this is this kind of makes sense. Okay, it will not it will not work always, but it makes sense. Okay, why? That it will be text description uh, description similarity. What is this? Metrics have names. Okay, maybe we have uh, lazy names like sensor zero, sensor one, sensor two. Okay, but maybe we have real names like sales in Germany, revenue in Germany. Uh, whatever in Germany, okay? So now these metrics that maybe are uncorrelated, that they are describing different things, they are describing something that comes in the name, something that is common in Germany, okay? I'm saying Germany like I can say any other uh, country. So the thing is the following, that now we can, we can correlate also metrics in terms of their names, okay? And find correlations among them. If we go to the next one, and the third one, it will be normal behavior similarity, okay? Normal behavior similarity, what this just saying is to find the uh, metrics that are uh, normal, that they, they have the, the kind of the same shape in the normal behavior, okay? So we can do, for instance, it will be a, an easy approximation that it will be like a pattern-based representation dictionary, okay? So for instance, you have some, uh, pattern in some um, chunk of your series and this pattern is changing to another uh, pattern in a different chunk of the series, we just fill uh, a, a vector with these uh, representations, okay, and we just find correlations between these uh, metrics. So let's go to the next one. Okay, and this is for unsupervised, okay, for super uh, semi-supervised or supervised root cause estimation, and this, is, uh, this will be the one that we are going to show you in these slides because for unsupervised, uh, we didn't have data that 
will fit uh, and will be impressive in the sense that we have data that is, their names, for instance, are sensor, sensor 00, okay? And we cannot have any kind of uh, knowledge of the root cause of these uh, of these anomalies, okay? So if I tell you that uh, anomaly uh, that is coming from sensor 00 and sensor 01 are related, you will say, okay, whatever, okay? So that's why we are going to follow a supervised way. But the thing is that if you have prior knowledge about prior anomalies, okay, you can just make a classifier, okay? So you just go find a point and you just pass it for a, in a classifier, okay, that classify metrics in a different uh, area, whatever, okay? And they are just giving you uh, this, the exact knowledge about the origin of this cause, okay? And also there is a, a hybrid approach where we have, we cannot have, and this is this case, we cannot have a hybrid um, exogenous variables, okay? Where we have, okay, like um, a holidays or whatever, and we just can correlate it, okay? This kind of anomalous behavior with these exogenous variables, okay? So if we go to the next one, these are the results. The results for the, <clears throat> Supervised case, okay, the unsupervised case, uh, you are free to contact us and we can discuss plenty about it. And we are also hoping to find a, a good um, data set, okay, in order to, to uh, show the, the real power of this. Okay, so in this case, what we had is the in the water pump um, data set, we have uh, the historical database is gigantic, okay? So what we did is to chunk it, is to, to take a chunk and this chunk we trained, um, a classifier on the anomalous uh, labels. Okay, so these uh, these are the LightGBM features of the of the classifier. Okay, we jump to the next one. In this concrete uh, data set, the anomalous behavior that will be the ones. Okay, uh, can be separated in two different anomalous behavior. One that is broken and one that is called recovering. Okay, so by doing that, what we are able to do is to spot for each anomaly that we detect to say immediately if this anomaly corresponds to a broken stage or to a recovering stage, okay? And this has the future importance of LGBM in these two cases. Okay, so what are the results? And this is kind of a uh, blurry. Uh, the results are the following. <clears throat> for instance, remember about the, the isolated anomaly that it was a uh, seen in the in the plot okay that isolated anomaly that it was a false uh, positive <clears throat> thanks to the classifier to the post processing classifier okay because this is a special case where we have a supervised prior knowledge the thing is that thanks to that classifier we are able to discriminate false positive and to improve or or uh, precision okay so indeed that anomaly that it was a false positive once it goes through the classifier it is a, a regular point, okay? So the flag about the anomaly will not be uh, raised, okay? On the next one, okay, in this case, we have a bunch of anomalies, okay? There are uh, the red band that we have in, in all the sensors, okay? Corresponds to almost all of them are anomalous, okay? So thanks to the classifier, uh, these, anomalous, uh, these anomalies are coincident in time, okay? For, for these sensors and other ones. Thanks to this anomaly, Thanks to this classifier, what we are doing is just to plug the data, the data points that are anomalous at coincident times, and put it through the through the classifier. And surprise, surprise, what we are obtaining, what we are obtaining is the uh, that we are obtaining the anomaly in real time. And thanks to the classifier, we know that this anomaly corresponds to a broken stage. And then the rest of anomalies that we are detecting correspond to a recovering case. So all the true positives that we are, we are uh, obtaining have a, a precise characterization where the anomaly uh, is correctly defined. Next one. So, okay, next steps. Next steps, and this is something that we want to focus on. Okay, we have a bunch of uh, missing links that we have to fix in this case, but this is kind of a, an ambitious plan that we have. We want to build an anomaly detector in real time that it will be used for all uh, kind of uh, situations that are coming from IoT, okay? And it will be, uh, this is the thing that we have missed and we have not talked about, that are image real-time anomaly detection, okay? So the thing is that we now are able to detect anomalies in real time, okay? Because these models can be put on the edge, okay? For inference, we train this, for instance, the ensemble model, this gigantic model, we just train it on the cloud and put it on the edge and just take 
real-time inference about anomalies, okay? And this is kind of gigantic. And also, we are obtaining a, a root cause about these anomalies. But the thing is that now we are missing images, okay? We cannot deal with images. And this is the future steps that we are uh, hoping to, to follow, to, to use a convolutional neural network to extract features from the video inputs and then pass it through an LSTM-based model or a forecaster model or some model or ensemble of models that are sensitive to time. Okay, there is a bunch of work to do, but this is our hope uh, for the future. Okay, uh, so let's jump to the, to, to the conclusions. Okay, so the conclusions. Both of science, IoT are crucial. Okay, if I have an, an anomaly in the number of payments that my retail company is receiving, now we, I can be in trouble if I if I not able to spot it in real time. Okay, so we have developed, and this is uh, important, an automatical tool that is able to detect anomalies in real time. Okay, that is doing the whole thing in an automatic way: the pre-processing, the feature selection, how to select them, the features that go to the same model to obtain inference to we are able to split the, the, the metrics in different models in order to improve the scalability and to improve also uh, performance. The thing is that in addition to that, our system can also obtain insights into the uh, origin of the anomaly, okay? Because we are able to correlate the anomalies that are coincident in time, okay? And we're able to give an explanation. Also, the, the other case that is kind of a, a, um, a idyllic, okay, that it would be to have a prior knowledge of anomalies, then all these anomalies will be go through a um, classifier and then to give the exact meaning of this anomaly. But what are the future steps? The future steps are to look for a way to reduce the number of false positives, okay, to increase the uh, precision. We are kind of happy or kind of okay with the recall of our model, but the precision um, is kind of uh, over a 10% less, okay, than recall, okay? so. Our main hope is to improve it in and to increase our, uh, our uh, precision, okay? And and by and to do that, what we have to do is to try to obtain a more precise normal behavior. Also, we have to move to anomaly detection system to the computer vision field, or, okay, in order to extend this portfolio of, of use cases of this tool, okay? And um, finally, and we are finishing, and I promise that uh, maybe we are out of time, I want to thank, um, if you're interested in this uh, topic, you have to go to the AI and analytics services, okay, in Telefonica, okay, because we are doing here uh, this kind of stuff that for us, we think that is pretty cool, maybe, People will think that it's not, okay, but we are doing this interesting stuff. We are doing things with uh, computer vision. We are doing things with IoT. We are doing things in kind of all the realms that you can think about. So <clears throat> I want to thank them. And also uh, uh, we want to thank uh, Alejandro Narnez, who was one of the guys who was helping us at the early stages of this work. And, and without him, uh, this would be impossible. So thank you, all of you. And if you have any questions, they are more than welcome. Aitor, Pablo, thank you so much. Uh, that so was a very you. enjoyable, very complete talk. It was very interesting yeah. to hear the difference between anomalies and outliers and then this very impressive tool that you've built. But you've been a bit <coughs> naughty, I have to say. You've overrun by 25 yeah. so, so minutes. Sorry um, for the station. <laughs> no, you're just lucky so, so, because uh, yes, we are the last one. <laughs> I, you're the last one. I wasn't strict with you because we're late in the uh, in the other room, yeah. and we gave you a little bit of extra time. But uh, it was worth it for all of that extra information that we got. So yeah, we have a few questions yeah. for you. Uh, we'll have to be brief because we are running very behind schedule. Questions yeah. from Miguel Angel: Does the ensemble method use voting? Is the lightweight model available outside Telefonica? Uh, the ensemble is not using voting. The ensemble is minimizing the RMSE. Okay. Yes. And a question from Kenneth here. What is the computational cost of your present model in terms of computer memory requirements and training time? Uh, it's difficult to... Well, could, you, could you respond? No, uh, you, you, can, you can talk about that. No, it's difficult, it's difficult to, to respond to this uh, because we are in the early steps of our, our model. And um, the scale of our of our data, uh, as you see, is difficult to find a proper uh, anomaly detection data set. So in 
in the further steps uh, we are going to do with this this tool we are going to consider the the memory and the computational cost for for the model because we are running with a uh, with little with late, little data sets because because of the difficult of finding data proper data sets uh, we are in the early stage of the development of the model okay but all we can say is that the lighter version okay the lstm forecaster uh, model is uh, around 10 times faster in training okay yes. <laughs> thanks to you both we are now very much uh, running out of time there are some uh, comments here some feedback which is very congratulatory very people are very impressed with your model so hopefully they will get in contact with you via the networking section on the platform <laughs> and address specific questions to you there so all that remains for me is to say thank you very much to both of you and hopefully we'll see thanks. you soon thanks thank, to you thank you so it much it was a pleasure to talk thank you, you. it was thanks. a pleasure thank you